Roger Ebert is without his famous voice for now. When we last sat down together, he was writing notes, which his wife Chaz would read. Cold, calculated, and premeditated. Table 52, Art Smith's very hot Chicago restaurant, is internationally famous for its fried chicken and macaroni and cheese. Our first indication that something wasn't right today was when the mayor canceled a public appearance. Still not clear whether there ever was a gunman inside the Rubloff building this morning. The kind of day that may make you want to wear a yellow shirt, put your sleeves up a bit, loosen up your collar. It's really a remarkable thing to see the aftermath of what is left of this building after this natural gas explosion. ABC 7 News has learned that a veteran Chicago police officer is under investigation for allegedly making dozens of false DUI arrests and criminal charges may be coming soon. Now, we've obtained surveillance video from one of those arrests showing Officer Richard Fiorito in action on the night shift. Here's ABC 7's Kevin Roy now with his investigative report. Because of all the complaints against him, Chicago police ordered Officer Richard Fiorito to use a surveillance system in his squad car back in March. What you're about to see is video from his squad car that will be used as evidence in a federal civil case against Officer Fiorito. To date, 21 people are part of the lawsuit. All say they were victims of his bogus DUI scheme. Been drinking tonight? I had a cocktail earlier. Maybe I didn't ask you that. Have you been drinking tonight? This is dash cam video from Chicago police officer Richard Fiorito's squad car taken June 21st, 225 a.m. Other officers first came upon a man and his girlfriend sitting in their car after hours by the lakefront. And they call in Fiorito because he's had advanced training in making DUI arrests. Whatever you got in your mouth, again, get rid of it. That's the third time I told you. You understand me now? What Officer Fiorito wrote in his own police report is that this driver was so intoxicated he was unable to perform any of the standard field sobriety tests. Here, he's told to walk a straight line. Next, to touch his finger to his nose with eyes closed. And finally, to stand on one leg for 30 seconds, eyes closed. I've been doing DUIs since 1992, and I've never seen a subject do the one leg stand this well. Attorney John Erickson represents the man in the video and 21 others who are part of a federal civil suit against Officer Fiorito. Most, like Oscar Fiesel, and Lex Leakes claimed Fiorito targeted them in the Boys Town neighborhood along North Halstead, following them after leaving gay bars. I felt like I was targeted because I was walking out of a bar and he needed to make a DUI arrest. And then he goes, oh wow, two strikes, you're black and you're fag. And told me that I was, basically my life was going to be ruined because of this DUI. But both were found not guilty of DUI. The civil case charges that Officer Fiorito engages in a pattern of false arrests, then perjures himself in court testimony in order to rack up more than 300 DUI arrests per year. Mothers Against Drunk Driving awarded Fiorito for being the state's highest writer of DUI tickets. Are you proud of the DUI arrests that you've made over your career? I'm proud of everything I've done. We found Officer Fiorito after he just testified in another DUI case at the criminal courthouse, where he spends a lot of time, according to the lawsuit, being paid time and a half. The more DUI arrests that he makes, the more times that he has to go to court. The more times that he goes to court, the more money he makes. ABC 7 News has learned that Fiorito is also being investigated by the Cook County State's Attorney's Office. A grand jury has been hearing from witnesses like Susan Kolinek, who is deaf and says Fiorito ignored her requests for a sign language interpreter. Nonetheless, he still ordered her to perform field sobriety tests. Close my eyes, tilt my head back, and listen to verbal commentary. And I still told him, I'm deaf, I can't do that. And he laughed. Later, he said, You're not deaf. You're just drunk. But her DUI charge was dismissed. In a statement, Fiorito's attorney says the allegations are false, unfounded, and patently frivolous. And the allegations of targeting a group of individuals will be shown to be unsubstantiated. And to charges that perhaps you're targeting a single group of people, what would you say? No, I'm not. 
Two other Chicago DUI cops have been accused of similar DUI schemes in recent years. One was stripped of his police powers during his investigation. The other decided to retire and collect his pension rather than face impending charges. But even with dozens of complaints against him, Officer Fiorito is still out on the streets making DUI arrests. A Chicago Police Department spokesperson wouldn't say much about Fiorito, telling us only that he's under investigation by the Internal Affairs Division. And sources are telling us that criminal charges against him are expected and likely from the Cook County State's Attorney's Office. Kevin Roy, ABC7 News. ABC7's Kevin Roy tonight, live at the scene with the latest on this developing story. Kevin. Well, Kathy and Alan, I have to say this is really a remarkable thing to see the aftermath of what is left of this building after this natural gas explosion. It is behind me here. It's very dark here at this Belvedere plant, but we're going to try to zoom in here and show you the what is left of this building. It's about a 10 story building right there and three sides of the building literally blew off when the natural gas explosion happened at about 2.34 p.m. Now I am standing about at least a quarter mile away from that building right there and it was about a quarter mile away from there in the opposite direction where a man was killed by flying debris he was standing in the i-90 tollway oasis at belvedere on the westbound side we're told he may have been a trucker uh, may have been filling his truck with gas when flying shrapnel and debris came down from this explosion and hit him and killed him There's there's no word on his identity, uh, and police are still in the process of trying to notify his family. But we can tell you this again happened about 2.30 at the NDK America plant, and remarkably, nobody else was injured, according to officials with NDK America. That tall 55,000 square foot building opened in 2003. It cost two and a half million dollars, and inside, uh, what they do is they uh, actually grow synthetic quartzes inside that are used then and sold to cell phone manufacturers uh, used for cell phone equipment and it was one of those pressurized vessels that apparently blew up and the fire chief here says that this building was designed to blow apart the way it did and there's a huge amount of flying debris all over a debris field around the building uh, here in Belvedere. We're waiting for a news conference which should happen momentarily. We'll bring you more at 10. Live in Belvedere, Kevin Roy, ABC 7 News. Alan and Kathy? Okay, Kevin, thanks. ABC 7 News presents Surviving Suicide. Hello and welcome to our ABC 7 News special, Surviving Suicide. I'm Kevin Roy and I am a survivor of suicide. I lost my mother, Diane Marcus Roy, to suicide 13 years ago. That loss has been the driving force behind a special series of reports that ABC7 has produced over the past year in conjunction with the Carter Center in Atlanta. Former First Lady Rosalind Carter has been a longtime champion of mental health issues. From teenage suicide to campus killers committing suicide, in this special report we'll be examining many issues surrounding this mental health epidemic. Suicide claims more than 32,000 lives every year in the U.S taking nearly twice as many lives as homicide. It is the fourth leading cause of death for adults between the ages of 18 and 65. National statistics show every day about 80 Americans take their own life and 1,500 more attempt to do so. But because of the stigma still surrounding suicide, it's something we rarely talk about. We begin now with our first effort to try to change that. A very personal story, what happened to my mother and my family after she took her life. It's a story I first shared a few years ago. Pictures of the way my family used to be. These are my most treasured possessions. My mother's smile lights up every portrait. My father says she was the glue that held us together. She was the center of our lives. That's the type of person she was. But behind that bright smile, Diane Marcus Roy hid a lifelong battle with bipolar disorder, manic depression, which proved to be fatal. Growing up in River Forest, there were few clues when my family lived here. At her 50th birthday party, no one could have imagined my mother would be dead a year and a half later. Her life started to unravel in 1993. After 29 years of marriage, she announced she wanted a divorce. She left my father, sold the house, quit her law practice, and moved from Chicago to Sedona, Arizona, all within a year. 
She also had a newfound interest in anything that was of a spiritual nature. She was seeing uh, spiritualists, card readers, psychics. So many changes in so little time. Classic signs I would later learn of a manic phase. And so it was for the next six months. Her family wanting to believe these changes were all for the better. But then, suddenly, she crashed. On a summer night in 1995, I came home to a message on my answering machine. My father telling me my mother was threatening suicide. So what do you mean? You don't know if you can go on. Are you thinking about killing yourself? We flew her back to Chicago. She met with a suicide counselor and came up with a plan to leave Arizona and move back home. My mother even promised my sister and me that suicide was not an option. So in late August of 95, she flew back to Sedona, supposedly to sell her condo. Four days later, we got a call from the Sedona police. She was dead. She put herself in a bathtub. She lit candles. She had gone to the store and bought vodka. She never drank and she ingested this vodka as fast as she could. I think that I should have gotten on that airplane with her. I think I should have been smart enough to say no to going on the airplane. But I was none of that. My mother did leave us a note written nearly a month before she died. She signed it, forgive me if you can, love Diane. I feel like she damaged me. She hurt me in such a horrible, horrible way. Forgiveness has been difficult, especially forgiving ourselves for missing or overlooking some of the warning signs. Experts say a person might be suicidal if he or she talks about committing suicide, experiences drastic changes in behavior, withdraws from friends, loses interest in work, school, hobbies, or gives away prized possessions. My mom gave away her dog weeks before she took her life. Now, it all seems so obvious. She was mentally ill. Poor decisions and radical life changes sank her into a terrible depression. But tragically, my mother never was diagnosed as manic depressive. She did take antidepressants on occasion, but she was never hospitalized nor got the kind of help she really needed because she was an expert at concealing her true feelings. The psychologist who saw her at the suicide prevention center said to me, and I saw her later, that she was the best they had ever seen at hiding what she felt. The thinking is so fevered that one does false credit to think that your mom was logical and thoughtful at the time she killed herself. It was her illness speaking and not her. Her illness may have had the final word, but as my photo albums show, she spoke to us with love and caring during her 51 years. It is those words I now hear. It is those words that I still miss. Thirteen years later, I still miss her every day, but my family and I are able to look at those photos now and remember the many happy and joyful memories she gave us. For survivors of suicide, mental health experts say it's important to realize that more than 90% of those who complete suicide have a psychiatric illness. In the end, it's their illness that has taken over, and appreciating that fact is critical for coping with the guilt and the grief of being a survivor. This is ABC 7 News, Chicago's number one news, with Kevin Roy. This is ABC 7 News, Sunday morning. This early hour time is 6 o'clock. I'm Stacy Bach along with Kevin Roy. We're both wearing pink. And I know. And for Phil's Easter wearing Sunday, lavender. Let's check it with Phil. <laughs> and what's the forecast for this Easter Sunday, Phil? Uh, Kevin, Stacy, pretty few minutes, Stacy and Kevin. All right, Phil, thank you. Sure. In the news this Sunday, firefighters in the western suburbs rescued two people from a burning home early this morning. When they arrived on the scene, firefighters found flames shooting out the first and second floor windows. An older man was hanging out a second floor window with smoke pouring out around him. Firefighters brought the man down safely by ladder, and then they discovered an older woman in a back stairwell. There's been a string of gun violence in Chicago this past week. More than 40 shootings have happened since Wednesday. At least five people have been killed. Reginald Myers died yesterday. He was shot Friday near 69th and Paulina, just a half mile from a news conference where Chicago Police Superintendent Jody Weiss was talking about the violence. Chicago police say they are trying to curb violence by increasing efforts to target those using guns illegally.
We have rest up our... Despite the latest violence, Chicago Police Department's latest crime stats show the crime is actually down 7.9%. Still no charges in the shooting death of a mayor in downstate Washington Park. That's a small village located about 10 miles east of St. Louis. The body of 52-year-old Mayor John Thornton was found inside his car Thursday morning after it crashed into a tree. Police say he'd been shot three times at close range. Thornton was returning home from a second job. Two persons of interest have been released from custody and the investigation is continuing. Gadget gurus are talking about getting their hands on Apple's new iPad. Many people waited for hours in the rain Saturday until the Apple store on Michigan Avenue opened at 9 a.m. Now the new device is a laptop that will play movies and some games, but there's no camera or physical keyboard. Still fans came from far away to get one. The iPad starts at $499. Later this month, a new version capable of getting online via AT&T's wireless network will go on sale as well, and that one starts at $629. Time right now is 6.07, and coming up on ABC7 News Sunday morning, Christians around the world celebrating Easter today. Thousands gather for Easter Mass in St. Peter's Square this morning.